I think the key message that I am bringing to the audience here at the Trust Conference is that trust is an evolutionary concept. Um, evolution wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been trust. And what do I mean by that? If you look back to the beginning of the Big Bang and the evolution of life, it always happens in three stages. Entities become viable, independent, they bond together to form group structures, and those group structures cooperate, and you get to the next or a higher order entity. So it happened with atoms. Atoms became viable, independent. They bonded to form group structures, molecules, and those molecules cooperated to create cells. And then cells became viable and independent and bonded together to form organisms, and organisms cooperated to form creatures. One of those creatures, Homo sapiens, us, we're learning how to become viable and independent in the framework of our existence. Then we're bonding together to form group structures, and those group structures are cooperating to create a higher order entity. So the bonding part in humans is trust. And so trust is, in a sense, the next most important thing in the 13 billion years of evolution. 50 years ago, we had nations, and now nations are bonding together, like in the European Union, to create a, 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 a larger group structure. But where we need to get to is globe, a sense of global governance, where we can all work together to, what people popularly say, save the planet, but save our environment. But there's no trust amongst our G20 leaders. They're still all operating out of self-interest and not the common good. And so there's no trust between them, and we won't get there until we learn to build that trust. And that's why I say trust is an evolutionary concept. It's a shift from thinking about I to thinking about we. Thinking, a shift from thinking about what's in it for me to what's best for the common good, and from being the best in the world to the best for the world. That is a new paradigm of thinking which is so lacking from our leaders today. And um, so that caused me to write a book about that topic because I wanted to put it out there because this is, in a sense, our evolutionary way forward. We need to have reached a level of consciousness um, where we are comfortable with who we are. I, I call that personal mastery. Um, and it's got sort of linked to emotional intelligence in a sense. We may not be able to completely master our emotions. Uh, they sometimes take over, but we can quickly get back into a state of internal stability, if you like. Um, and that allows us then to use our reasoning and logical thought to find out what's best for moving forward. And what history shows us and what evolution shows us is that we are social creatures and that the only way we're going to move forward is together. And uh, it takes longer to move forward together. If you want to go fast, go alone, but if you want to go together, you have to go slow. Personal transformation is quite difficult because you have to take the courage. You, first of all, you have to have the courage to look at yourself and say, it's not working for me. You know, I'm feeling more pain than pleasure when I behave in this way. And so how can I look at myself? Now, the vast majority of the people on the planet don't look at themselves. They're just carried away by their emotions and thoughts. So the first stage is really about um, education and get, begin, beginning to realize that there are other people out there, particularly other people from different religions and nations, that see the world differently. They have a different worldview. And so you have to be able to, in a sense, stop looking at the world through your lens and be able to see that other people have lenses which are different to yours and, and it creates conflict. And if we could just adapt our lenses to accommodate the best of what all of the different lenses are showing, we could actually live together more peacefully and more happily. And so that happens only after we've reached a stage of development where we've taken care of our basic needs, what Maslow's basic needs, survival, relationship, self-esteem, and then uh, we get to the point where we can feel uh, happy with who we are, and then something else kicks in, 
And what that is, is we begin to feel what I call the impulse of the soul. The impulse of the soul is a search for meaning, for our own personal search for meaning. But whilst we're totally absorbed in survival, relationship, self-esteem levels, it blocks that opening for the soul impulse. And so in a book I wrote called What My Soul Told Me, I describe the stages of soul activation. What begins to happen is you, uh, as you let go of the fears in your life, you open yourself up to this influence and you get these, uh, what I call, inspirations. Like, oh, I need to do that. And the other thing that happens is you get something called synchronicity happening in your life. It's unconnected events with a common meaning. And you begin to notice that synchronicities are happening time after time after time, and they all have the same message. And you think, wow, I better pay attention. And that's because the soul is an energetic being. It's, it's who we are. It's our energy field, in a sense. And it exists at another level of consciousness beyond the physical world, but in the energetic world, the quantum world of reality. And so when we, because <laughs> we have these five physical senses, but uh, we can't see this energetic world because, not because it isn't there, because um, our senses are limited to three-dimensionality. Three-dimensionality is a property of, not of the world, but of our senses. And when you realize that, and you think, oh my God, there's other things out there, and you, then you get these inspirations and you hear this voice. It, it's more than intuition. Intuition is when you get a spark of an idea and you think, oh yeah, that solves that problem. Inspiration, the voice of the soul, is much deeper. There's almost like you have to follow that voice, otherwise there are consequences. And the consequences are very often depression. For example, uh, you may be a trained at university to be a dentist or a doctor or a writer or whatever, uh, writing in newspapers, but your passion may be cooking or it may be caring for horses or whatever, but here you are in your life earning a good living from this thing that you learned to do, but actually you're not that passionate about it. You begin to not look forward to go to work every day. And there's this voice saying, oh, yeah, you, you know, this is where your passion is. And when you follow that passion, you're actually following the voice of the soul. And that's how we find fulfillment. Who we are when we grow up and get into our 20s is basically a reflection of the parental programming and cultural conditioning that we had. And we get to the age of 20 or 30, that's who we are. And the reason we are that way is because we had to fit in in order to survive. But there comes a point there, it's called individuation, where you begin to realize that who you really are at the soul level is not who you think you are and who you grew up. It's not your cultural condition. It's not your parental programming. It's more than that. And that's the, the, called the individuation process. And during that process, you begin to find out what values are important to you. And, um, and they may be different from your parents and the culture. And that can cause problems, particularly, in, let's say, in tribal cultures or very strongly uh, uh, religious cultures. What's happening in, in the Middle East right now in some nations, uh, um, the, the very strong hold of a religion is, is preventing some people from self-actualizing because they're not able to be free to be who they really are. If you want to raise the level of trust in an organization, you have to be able to measure what the culture is giving you. Now, talent dynamics works at a personal level. It links you to your passion, and then you, the team is rearranged so that people work on what they're passionate about. However, that doesn't tackle the problem of culture. You can still have a, a, a difficult, toxic culture. So you need to be able to measure the culture. And that's what we do in our cultural transformation tools. We map the values, people's personal values, the values they see in the organization, the values they'd like to see in the organization. And, and the results of that diagnostic tell you immediately 
what level of cultural entropy, what degree of dysfunction there is in the organization and what you need to do in order to resolve that problem. There isn't a, there isn't a cutty cutter, uh, cookie cutter uh, solution. You have to be able to measure for every organization, every team, what is working and not working and to what extent people's personal values align with the current culture and to what extent the current culture they believe aligns with the desired culture and very often there is a mismatch yeah. and uh, when and you present to break when the personal level of consciousness is higher than the consciousness of the company it's it's hard to break the rules so you're very correct in saying when the personal consciousness of the individual is higher than the consciousness of the company people are going to find it difficult and if they can get another job they'll leave or if you're at a lower level of employment, a, a clerk or a laborer, I mean, uh, you won't be able to leave unless you can find a, you want to find a, a better paying job. You'll just be dissatisfied, disgruntled. And so what happens is you get low levels of employee engagement when that happens. When the contrary is true, when the organization's levels of consciousness are higher than the people's. People have the room to grow and develop and find fulfillment. And that's where, where we measure the, the consciousness of organizations by mapping value to find out what needs to be done. And generally speaking, it's a leadership issue because the consciousness of the leaders is reflected in the culture of the organization. So if you want to improve the culture, the leaders have to change or you have to change the leaders. And so it's as simple as that. And so once you've got these results, you begin to see how to change because we can also map the values of the leaders by saying, having the leaders go online and pick 10 values about how they think they operate and having 15 people that they choose go online and say how they think this leader is operating. And when we compare the two against the levels of consciousness, there's either a match or a mismatch. Uh, the mismatch might be uh, the leader sees himself up here and the people see him down here with a high level of personal entropy. That's like values such as um, short-term focus, blame, etc., etc. Or it's the other way around or where sometimes um, the, uh, the, the people, the employees, see the, the, the leader quite highly, but the leader hasn't really fully embodied that and sees himself operating at like an average level. And that's good news for that leader, but they need to own up to it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so really, um, building a, a cohesive culture, it all comes back to leaders, all comes back to the culture they create through the consciousness that they have. So if you want to improve the culture of an organization without changing the leaders, then the leaders have to get involved in uh, what I would call leading themselves then learning how to lead a team, and then how to learn to lead an organization. They have to work on themselves if they want to change the culture. I'm very optimistic about the future, and I'll tell you why. First of all, a couple of reasons. First of all, you know, Homo sapiens represents the cutting edge of 13 billion years of evolution. Evolution has been going on. I can't see us stopping it, but what's going to happen is things are going to get really painful for us, and we're going to have to change, all right? I, I can see that. That's coming along. And that's very often what forces change, um, is that pain. And until the rich countries of the world are feeling the pain, which they are more and more, they won't come together to resolve the problems of humanity. And that's what we, we have to do. We turn to survival level on the level of countries? Uh, we may, and uh, it's already existing, but we need to recognize, as we do in a nation, that the nation can only move forward to the extent that you are able to care for the poorest people in that nation. And that's why we have taxation systems, in order to care for those people. Now, what we need is a similar mechanism at a global level. We don't really have that. And if once we get that, then we can lift the people in poor nations out of the survival relationship self-esteem level, the basic needs level, we can lift them out of that level to the possibility of transformation and building a society in that nation which becomes democratic. Again, I could refer back to the Middle East. This is what's happening right now. That's the struggle. It's the struggle between, between religious values and secular values, and it's moving from... Uh, 
you have to do things this way to a democratic process. Now, not all democracies are successful. There's many graduations of democracies. And if you look at the Economic Intelligence Unit, they, they, they have a system for measuring that. Uh, the, currently, the UK is like number 19, and the USA is number 21 in levels of democracy. The most dem democratic nation on the planet is Iceland. There's only 250,000 people they get together in the pub, and they, you know, they, they work things out. So many different levels. So my research, which I published in a book called Love, Fear, and the Destiny of Nations, shows that um, as the level of fear goes down, the level of democracy goes up. So there's a relation. There's a direct relation between the level of fear and the level of democracy. So the most democratic nations have populations which have the least fear. And I was amazed when that straight line relationship came out. And, um, and so, uh, I mean, ultimately, the, the way forward is, in a sense, spiritual. <laughs> it's about, it's, it's the like golden rule. It doesn't even work. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's the golden rose by, you know, doing unto others as you have it with them that do unto you. It's about compassion. It's about empathy. And uh, business is kind of hasn't quite got there yet. But the most successful organizations, and uh, some of them, I write about them in my new book, The Value Driven Organization, and also there's a book called Conscious Capitalism, which is out, um, where they see that the, the most successful organizations are the ones that not just care about their employees and they care about their customers, they care about the environment, they care about the um, communities in which they live, and they care equally about them all. And when you do that and you make decisions which show that you care for all your stakeholders, mm -hmm. your stakeholders care about you. And that creates a successful company.